Mike Nichols is one of our great film and theater directors. He came to the United States in 1939 as a refugee from Nazi Germany. Starting as a performer, he and Elaine May became a team, changed comedy, and sold out the house during a Broadway run in the early 60s. Later, he moved to directing, first for the theater in Neil Simon's Barefoot in the Park. Then, in film, he created classics, including Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, The Graduate, and Carnal Knowledge. You've had yourself an evening. You've had yourself quite a night. And you can't cut it out just whenever there's enough blood in your mouth. We're going on, and I'm going to have at you, and it's going to make your performance tonight look like an Easter pageant. So? Mrs. Robinson, you're trying to seduce me. <laughs> Aren't you? Let me see your hand. Mm. Well? Mike Nichols recently returned to the stage in London to great reviews as an actor in the designated mourner. In between, he has lived an extraordinary life, earning a reputation for exploring the deep currents beneath the surface of behavior and earning the trust of actors. The dialogue with Mike Nichols took place at the Metropolitan Museum of Art here in New York, where its president, Bill Lures, introduced the first in our series of conversations from the Met. I'm Bill Lures, president of the Metropolitan Museum. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you this evening to Charlie Rose at the Met. Charlie Rose has taken the interview format to a new level of intellectual, political, and human discourse at a time when television in general seems to be headed in the opposite direction. Tonight, Charlie has brought to the Met one of the giants of the American film industry to talk about the evolution of that quintessential American art form, the film. Join me in welcoming to the Met, Charlie Rose with Mike Nichols. Thank you for doing this. It's a pleasure, I think. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out. Uh, you and I sat down at lunch uh, with other people maybe a year ago. And at that time, you had just bought Primary Colors. Mm -hmm. And I said, why did you buy it? And you said, well, I wasn't interested at the beginning. But then, having read it, I realized it was about honor and friendship. Mm -hmm. What did you mean? Well, I, I've, I've long had a theory that, that, that honor is one of movies' favorite subjects. When you, when you think of the movies that we love, whether it's Lawrence of Arabia or Casablanca, that, that, that the spine of those movies, the, the spine of movies very often is honor and the definition of honor. Um, and I, I certainly thought Primary Colors was is about honor and and this strange thing about movies that movies love friendships that that they love stories about friendships even in a way more than love stories that that at the at the center of of many movies that that mean a lot to us is this strange thing of friendship and and primary colors is very much about friendships and and the band on the road once you got into it did it stay about that or did it become as you brought your actors together and you immersed yourself in it all about something else or did it stay about that it it stayed about that but it also became about in a very sort of personal way for all of us it became about where we are now not only, I mean, obviously we didn't know the events that would transpire just before the movie came out. That was a surprise for us. But it was, as we worked on it, very much about our process, about the degree to which scandal has taken over uh, the front pages of, of all newspapers now, not just tabloids. Um, and a great deal of time on TV. And we were in many ways in the middle of it. One of the actors was going through a, a difficult personal divorce and was in a lot of headlines and was being chased and, and uh, 
things that were not true were being printed, and it, it was very much part of what we were living among as we made it. If you look back at what you have made from carnal knowledge through primary colors, is there a pattern that you see there about what you have chosen to do looking back? Well, I don't look, you know. I, it, it's a, it's a, a strange and, and uh, not very comfortable feeling to look back. And I, I don't tend to sort of extrapolate principles about whatever I've done it's sort of like I'm the bird and someone else has to be the ornithologist. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah. And I don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. But those who look back say the following things. If you look at the themes of your movies, it is about sexual adventurism. It is about men and women. It's about relationships. It's about betrayal. It's about honor and friendship. Yes, th those are certainly my concerns. The main are... theme that goes through what you've done. Well, when Elaine May and I were, were in a, a comedy group, an improvisational group in, in Chicago at the turn of the century, <laughs> and was... when we all did, we improvised various scenes and, and Elaine and I ended up doing something that the rest of the group always called people scenes. <laughs> which I guess meant that they were only about people. There was no more to them than that. Um, it, it's, it's what's always interested me, the things that go on between people, especially the unstated, less than immediately visible things that go on between people. And I, there's something about a group of people looking at something, all apprehending something unspoken that is very exciting to me. It's, it's what I love in the theater at its best, and it's what I love in movies, that it's like you describe the space around something, and the thing that in the middle that is not referred to is, is apparent as a yeah. result. It's what they say about Mirandi, that he paints the space between the bottles. Now, can you translate that to primary colors in terms of of what the subtext was or what the unconscious was that you were working with there? I, I think there were a lot of things in primary colors that are about the nature of love and marriage, um, the ma nature of love between and among friends, and about this odd moment in which we find ourselves in which at least according to the polls and, and the endless conversations that we can see on television, nothing personal, uh, and the, our own endless conversations. I have a friend who went to the White House for dinner about a month ago, and he said it was the only time in three months that he'd been to dinner every, anywhere that they weren't talking about Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> yeah, <you tell> <laughs> <laughs> it's, the, it's the only place the name didn't come up. <laughs> but, but we've all been part of a, an unending conversation on these subjects. Speaking, and, go ahead. Sorry, no, no you, just that that's in a funny way what, what the movie turned out to be about through no design of our own. About Monica Lewinsky? No, about where we find ourselves, about at the moment. how do we get the toothpaste back in the tube? Because we, er, most people seem to feel that. It would be nice to get some of this toothpaste back in the tube, not specifically necessarily, you know, the, the Lewinsky scandal, but just this idea that, that private life is no longer private, that scandal is the lead and that we're all following a kind of big soap opera based on living people. I, I was thinking the other day about Dickens and Dostoevsky and how they used to write things in installments in the newspaper and that's how people read their novels first, that they were, right. you know, breathtaking installments and what would happen next. Almost like serials. Like serials. And everyone 
talked about them that way. Oscar Wilde, as you, as you will remember, said that only a man with a heart of stone could read The Death of Little Nell without laughing. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, but they, they followed these things, and now we follow what is ostensibly real. Yeah. But that's complicated, isn't it? But I, I, I want to explore it. it. Do you think the realness, the fact that you, quote, you were quoted as saying, life is now imitating art, and can we tell the difference? I never realized how much it was happening until Monica brought us all up short. These two things, real life and so-called fiction, have long been on a, pan, on a path that intersects. Did this intersection of real life and a movie you were making hurt the movie? Well, I'll never know. I, it certainly did not hurt the experience of watching the movie. Whether it hurt the movie's business, who can say? You know, somebody wrote a very interesting article about, in The New Yorker, I think it was, about movie grosses and, and this uh, theory of physics. I can't even remember the name of it. It's not random. It's some, something like... Uh, it's something that... We do have a physicist in the office. Okay. <laughs> it was about these gas molecules that sometimes they would cluster and sometimes they wouldn't. And there was right. no reason for either. Right. It would just happen. And I think... What is it? Chaos theory. Chaos theory. Chaos theory. Exactly. Very good. Chaos, that's the word. <laughs> yeah. And they were applying the yeah. chaos theory to movie grosses, which is really serious subject to pursue. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, did an executive in Hollywood order this up? I'd like to see the chaos theory applied to movie grosses. Well, it has been. <laughs> but th this man who wrote this piece said that you could make a case that it, it is as illogical as the gas molecules that sometimes people go and sometimes people yeah. don't go. So you can't explain why it was disappointing the box office any more than you can explain why Titanic took off to a billion dollar level. Well, you can explain it to some extent, absolutely. Titanic is the great story of the century, and it always has been. And we've known that. Titanic is the first story I ever heard. My father told it to me when I was four. And I remember every moment of what he told me, because it is a but thrilling I'm... story and a horrifying story and has great power. Yeah. Um, there's that. There's the fact that that when our picture came out, surely... As, as some people speculated, people thought, well, I've seen this on television, I've read about it, do I really want to go to a movie theater to see more of it? I mean, that seems perfectly reasonable when you're seeing it 24 hours a day. Well, Barry Levinson has said that whenever there's a movie, uh, the more relevant it is to real life, the more difficult it is in attracting an audience. Now. Now. Today. I, I think that's true. I think that I remember a moment very long ago now when we were talking about some group of people were talking about some good movie, a Kurosawa movie maybe, and, and someone said, well, I'd rather see Butch Cassidy. Uh, and that was a very interesting moment for me, and it was a very interesting title that they should mention because... Butch Cassidy was the first movie about other movies. Yeah. It was the first time it occurred to anybody that you could make a movie basically about the movies that we all liked in the past. And movies thereupon began to a, an increasing extent to be about movies and about themselves. So today, movies are more about movies than they are about life. I think you could make that case. And I think you could make the case that we all, we are the audience after all, that we all want something that takes us away from life rather than that helps us to explore our lives. But you have said that when you go to a movie, what you want to do is find something that makes you understand yourself more and your experiences better. Well, the first thing you want to have is an experience period. Right. You want the movie to, to give you an experience. If you're able in that experience to say, oh my God, 
I know that man, I am that man, that, that's a particular kind of uh, experience that, that at least some of us still like very much. If you ask of movies, as we also do, that movies transfigure everything and ourselves and, and take you somewhere that you haven't been, somewhere perhaps that doesn't exist, that's, first of all, a perfectly legitimate experience to, to wish for, as many experiences are. I mean, there, I, it's a, it's, there aren't good or bad in these things. It's just what turns you on. And I think that life has become so much about us every minute. There, television is so much about our processes. The, the things we read are so much about ourselves and our processes, it's perfectly understandable that we want to go to Mars and that we want to get out of here for a couple of hours. I do. Find a place that we can't go. Yes. It's, and th that's a, the whole Spielbergian and George Lucas, I can't do a Lucasian approach, uh, approach to movies is a very exciting one. And it was exciting for all of us when it began. I remember with the first Star Wars, we, everybody was thrilled. That's, that's great. It, it would be nice if we can move in both directions, as indeed we really are. I want to go back to the movie because we have a clip. If you haven't seen Primary Colors, tell me why you like this. This is a clip of interesting thing about primary colors it's like it's about a lot of themes that that i enjoy which is the notion of what is greatness and the notion of huge appetites and the notion of of uh, people who aspire to do great things at the same time are willing to make compromises to do it and justifies the means and all those kinds of things um the scene is when john travolta playing jack stanton well you set it up uh I, I think you'll see in the clip, which is very long, um, I figured do a long clip, it's going to be better than us talking. <laughs> it, it is that the scandal has just broken, and everybody in, in the organization is worrying about it, and the governor is otherwise engaged, as becomes clear. Roll tape. Well, we can't ignore it. I mean, you know, they might have given him Chicago because that was 30 years ago. They might have given him Cashmere because she was paid for the story. But I mean, the two right on top of one another. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, right. I mean, people are going to be saying, do we really want a former radical hippie, you know, that messes with hairdressers? He did not Cashmere McLeod. For the director, what was that about? It was about a lot of things. I, I was just thinking, looking at it, that one of the nice things about my job is that, is that you discover things within things that when we're in the... This was the first... When I read the book, this was the first scene that I saw. This was the scene that let me know that it w could be a movie that I could make because I could see both the, the donut shop and how we approached it and how at the end of the move-in Henry would walk in. and That was all there the, sec the first time I read it, which is, which is the way I find out whether I'm going to do it. But I didn't know things, for instance, like the third time Danny Scanlon says, Apple Fritter, that the, the reason that the governor interrupts Henry Burton's irritable, no, I just said, interrupts it by saying, um, I'll have one, Danny, but just one. I didn't know the reason was kindness, that it was, I thought he just wanted a donut. <laughs> but when you're there, you discover such things, and that's that's the best part of it. That's that is what it's about. That in small moments, one small moment after another, 
you discover things about a person. In this case, it's that, that he wants to save, without judging Henry's impatience and without judging Danny, who doesn't remember that he asked a moment ago, he just wants to save Danny from the momentary unkindness of Henry. And those are the, the little pebbles that one at a time go to make up a movie. And also to go to make up a human being. You, exactly. Funny you should say that. Because on our opening night in, uh, in L.A., Emma Thompson, who is a, a great woman, um, gave me a, a quote from Oscar Wilde that I'd never seen before. And it was, each small action of the common day makes or unmakes character. What was it about an evening with Mike Nichols and Elaine May that was different, that was so startling for its time, that brought you to Broadway and sold out for a year? I don't know. Uh, I, I think a lot of it was that we'd been off in Chicago sort of doing our stuff and that we were, it, we were doing a fairly complicated thing. We just didn't know it. We were both wishing to be the people we were doing in our sketches, that is to say, the basketball star and, and the cheerleader, neither of which we were. And we were both making fun of ourselves for not being them and making fun of them for being them and generally working something out between us. And, uh, and we were funny. And, and we, d we did the things that, that uh, I know this from Jules Pfeiffer, who's explained to me why he was amazed when he saw it. We did the things that people hadn't yet done about, right. about sex and necking and, and, uh, and mothers and sons and, and various, various stuff that was coming out of our lives. Why did it break up? I think Elaine just got tired of it. Um, Elaine I, got tired yeah, of it. She, yeah, I didn't, I didn't find it very hard. Here is the conventional wisdom. It is that you um, were happy to do it. She wanted to be more experimental. You liked the fact that it was a commercial success and sold out, and you were happy just to coast right along. That's, well, not coast exactly, well, but that's fair. No, that's fair. Yeah. And Elaine wanted to do new things, and I didn't, because it had taken us three years to come up with this material. <laughs> and I, I felt, I felt a, a pressure from the audience, you know. And they were charging them money and everything. And I wanted, to, I wanted us to come through. Yeah. And Elaine was bored and wanted to do new things. That's true. But there's another thing, which is that she could do new things more easily than I, because she is and was a, a brilliant, complicated, inventive actress. And I'm not that good an actor, and I'm not that, that good an improviser. And I needed to push it forward always. She could fill it with more and more, and I pushed it forward. I wanted to tell the story. So those are director skills. Who hired you for Barefoot in the Park in 1964? St. Suber, who was the producer. Yeah. He called me up and said, do you want to direct this play? And I said, I never thought of that. Let, let's take it to summer stock and see if I'm any good. So we did. And you have said before that, as you just mentioned with Lee Strasberg and with Elaine, all of a sudden it was like everything you had been trained to learn anew prepared you to do the thing you were then doing. Yes. You were born to be a director, so it's, to speak. So it turned out. I, it, I, it's the first time of, of many times that I've become interested in, it sounds so pretentious, but in the part that our unconscious plays in our work, because I really did discover that this is the thing for which I'd been preparing, but I didn't, hadn't known it. You are, in fact, fascinated by the unconscious and, and how it plays out in terms of any kind of creative endeavor. Very interested. For a long time, I thought, and I still partly think, that it's a great way to justify my laziness, that <laughs> I can just say, I'm letting the unconscious work, <laughs> and that frees you from doing anything yeah. much. Uh, but I'm also interested, very interested by the things that you find yourself doing, and you're not sure why, that lead to, I mean, the example I always use, perhaps too often, is that the last scene in The Graduate, that, that uh, 
I, when we shot it... At the church, is that the last scene? Leaving the church, getting on the bus, I said to Dustin Hoffman and Catherine Ross, to whom I'd been very nice for the whole movie, I said, now get on that bus, we've stopped traffic for 20 bucks, we can't do this over, get on the bus and laugh. And they looked <laughs> terrified. They had tears in their eyes, and I said, what is wrong with me? Why am I treating them like this? Yeah. And then the next day I saw the dailies, and I thought, oh, I know why. I see it's the end of the movie. They are terrified. Did I plan this? Did I know it? Not at all. I didn't have a thought in my head. I thought. And I am very interested by that aspect of what we do because it's one of the things that we're dealing with. You're also trying to find, I mean, the subjects, the things that interest you or whatever it is beneath the surface, as we said earlier. I mean, the subconscious and yes. the sense of, of whatever it is that's beneath the surface, those turbulent currents beneath make where what you think is happening in the essence of somebody's yes and it really you know it's it's it is the essence of modern theater it's not my idea it, it was it's Chekhov's gag you know it's Chekhov who thought of it it's Chekhov who said okay we've got these people right a loves B B loves C C loves D D loves E E loves A now you know and you watch what happens that that was his idea and that's what transformed the theater before we leave the theater because we're going to talk about films here is an interview that i did uh, with neil simon and your name came up you haven't seen this roll tape but mike nichols was a major influence on me because i looked up to him so much it's not that he had more experience because i was older than mike and he hadn't even directed a play yet uh, when we asked him to do uh, Barefoot in the Park, I at least had done two shows. He Sympathy. made the odd couple better. Oh, yeah. Every play we did, he made better. Made better. Yes. But he made better by making me make it better. He never said, in this scene, you do a thing where he does this and she does that. He yeah. says, this isn't working. He called me up at 3 o'clock in the morning. You sleeping? No, Mike. I was just sitting waiting for your call. <laughs> call. I know you're going to call me at 3 in the morning. I think the best example uh, is in the book when we were up in... Um, New Haven with Prison of Second Avenue. He said, the end is no good. I said, well, we'll find out tomorrow night. He said, well, why find out tomorrow night? Let's do it now. I said, Mike, it's 12.30, 1 o'clock in the morning. I'm tired. I can't think of anything else. He says, how do you know you can't? So we sat in the lobby. We sat in the lobby. I hated him at this moment. He made me sit there for two hours. And after, after throwing ideas at each other, which we both were saying, terrible, awful, forget it. And then it was like an hour of quiet. And then I said, I'd have to go back to the whole play to explain it, but I'll just get to it. And said, what about if it snows and he goes and he gets the shovel out of the, uh, the, the closet and they sit there looking like the American Gothic? He didn't even say if it was good or not. He said, I'll get the snow and the shovel. I'll see you at rehearsals tomorrow. We did, and the ending worked. <laughs> Do you remember that? Yeah, I you then went on to make films. Um... Who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? What's the challenge for the director? Well, to turn a play into a movie and to... It's always the same challenge, you know. It's funny, we were talking before about journalism, and I assume that the question, if you're a journalist, is what really happened? Right. Well, if you do my job... And why? And why? And in my job, the question is... There's only one question. What is this really like when it happens? Not what are the conventions, not what have we accepted, not how do people do this, not what is an angry scene generally, but what is it really like? What can we examine this to discover about actual life, not, not conventions? And this was a brilliant piece of material to ask those questions of. How do you get it? get the answer yes what well it's really like well i do the reality of what's happening to a marriage and to a, i do very weird things in rehearsal i tell slightly embarrassing stories about myself and it takes the actors a while to get it sometimes they think i'm just very anecdotal <laughs> and then with luck they catch on and they start telling slightly embarrassing stories about themselves which is my 
purpose that we begin not, not to make confessions or tell appalling personal things, but to, to discuss behavior and what happens between people in this or that kind of situation. And then pretty soon, we're dealing in the thing that constitutes the scenes. We're dealing in, in human behavior and human response to this or that kind of pressure. You believe, you prepare like crazy. You do everything you can. And then when you come to the set, whether it's theater or whether it's film, in a sense, you look for the surprises. You let it happen. You are what? Well, certainly in a movie, that to me is the essence of making a movie, that you prepare like crazy and then you wait to discover what happens. And it'll be a surprise will come. Yes. Every day is a surprise. That's the joy of making movies. You have to hope it's a good surprise and that they got it on film. How is it that you could make The Graduate, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, Carnal Knowledge, and then a series of films that you that weren't so good. Mm -hmm. Midway along the pathway of my life, I found myself in a dark forest. I got lost. I couldn't tell you so easily why, but I think what happens is that you start out interested by the subject of various plays and movies and the process. And then that goes very well. And then pretty soon people are saying, I guess you're worried about the next one, huh? No. But I mean, what if it's a failure? Well, what if it is a failure? But you haven't had any failures. So pretty soon you're thinking about success and failure, which you weren't to begin with. And then you go to Hollywood and there's a virus in Hollywood, which it took me a while to figure out that you had to try to live somewhere else because a lot of the concentration is on how you're perceived. And that's catching, that virus is catching. And it's, it's, uh, it's deadly because any time spent worrying how you're perceived uh, is it's very corrosive to you and to you, what you do and I, it took me a, a while to figure out well the first thing is don't read the trades everybody reads the trades and it's very bad for me to read the trades even now I look over somebody's shoulder and it says such and such a director and I say what did he get what he got paid what and that's Schlemiel, and, so, and, and there I'm lost. Yeah. I can't even start. And it took me a long time to sort all that out. Where to live, to some extent how to live, how to concentrate, what was important to me. And I, I think that at least in, in theater and movies, there's a time in the middle where you just plain forget how to do it. And then with any luck, um, it comes back. How did you pull yourself out of it? I just went on. I went on, I fell in love. I, I did all those things that you do. Um, and I got older. They don't tell you that there's all this good stuff that comes with getting older. <laughs> Films for you are like dreams. Yeah, they are like dreams in that, in that they contain messages in the same way and that they're strangely personal in the same way. And that in some way they're, they're, they're coming out of our, at least partly out of our unconscious as we watch them because they're connecting with the... With, uh, well, with actual dreams that we've had. In any moment, when you make a movie, it finds a life of its own in the process. I mean, does Silkwood or... Well, that's the nice thing about making a movie is that if you're lucky, if it's any good, at a certain point it jumps in your hand and is alive and, and pretty much begins to tell you what it wants, which is a moment I always love. 
that it it's like turning a light on and off as you go through it. Some scenes obviously have to stay, some scenes have to go on the spot because they've died overnight. Um, and the, the movie begins to take its own path. Do you like the editing process? Very much. I now like all of it. I used to be terrified of shooting for the obvious reasons that it's now or never in every sense. Uh, but I, I now like every stage of it. The editing process is great. You know, who, where, if only life had an editing process. <laughs> you can choose to make it the way you want to. You, you get can a second cut the chance. bad out, and you can make it look as good as it possibly can. That's right. You can make it dance, you can make it... And you can follow its secrets, you know. You can say, well, this isn't quite clear. Maybe we need her looking at him yet again so that we know that's why he crosses the room you can it's it's the thing we wish we could do with life how is filmmaking today primary colors all the way back to uh who's afraid of virginia Woolf, different for you how are you different as a filmmaker with all this experience very little the, the only thing that might be different for me personally is i'm a little nicer than i was because i I'm just not as crazed and and I don't feel this great pressure and I don't have to drive everybody else crazy in quite the same way because I've learned for me that if you if you have a nice time and you don't yell and scream and carry on and push it just happens just as well it, it's no worse sometimes it's better because people were happy is it a curse to be when you were 30 you hit this town on 29 with an evening with Nichols and May. Uh, then you went on, as we've said, for Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, and The Graduate, which is considered a masterpiece, and then Carnal Knowledge, and it came back with Silkwood, and all the things in between. Is having so much attention, uh, does it set up unfair standards for you as an artist? I mean, do you, are you running against Mike Nichols every time you go to bat? No. But well, that's where my poor sense of reality comes in. I, I once asked Marlon Brando to drop a name, whether, whether it was how tough it was when he first came to Hollywood to do whatever it was, Streetcar, whatever his first, the men, how, how did he manage with everybody making such a fuss? And he said, oh, honey, he said, I, I didn't see all that. I was just so busy trying not to go crazy. <laughs> and that's the answer, really, that, that you have other things, you have other fish to poach, you know, that, that you're not, you don't really spend very much time worrying about what the expectations are, what anybody might think of you, because you're all busy just Let trying to get Let me tell you why I don't believe that's totally true. Tell me. Because you have been, you have said before that sometimes when people compare what you do and say, well, it may not be as good as, they have forgotten that Mike Nichols has been working for a long time and turning out good movies, and they forget that you're still at it. And a lot of people have fallen by the wayside, and a lot of people, <laughs> stay with me, a lot of people, you know, don't know how hard it is to continue to do good work because as you go up that ladder you're getting you're not getting the same kind of material it's not every day somebody gives you who's a friend of Virginia Woolf or the graduate or birdcage or whatever it might be I'm absolutely horrified to hear you quote me as saying that and I, I can tell you why one I remember saying it <laughs> enough reason to be horrified yeah. but another is that it happens that about three weeks ago, I was at a small lunch for Louise Reiner, if you remember yeah, her. Right. Louise Reiner was the only person who ever, until recently, won the Academy Award two years in a row. She was a very, very, very big deal movie star, and then she left and disappeared. And she's 89. And here's what she said at the lunch. She said, you know, my rivals... Garbo, Dietrich, they're all dead! 
<laughs> she said, and I'm still here, you're right. <laughs> you know, I thought that was really funny, and then I, you quote me, I realized I said it too. <laughs> there, yes, it's true. There is part of you that says, hey, guys, you know, I've been doing this for a century. Yeah. And, and I'm still here, and, and a lot of my colleagues are not. And I'm lucky, is what you come up saying. I'm lucky. And the point about all that other stuff, about am I the third best, am I the fourth best now, who's the very best? You know, Orson Welles told me the one time when we worked together, he said, look, he said, everybody does that so much. He said, we don't have to do it. Leave it to them. And it was very good advice, and it, it's a very bad habit when you find yourself doing it because it's so fruitless. You end up nowhere. How do you know? You have no idea. So it, it's best not to think about it. You also wonder, too, about how much should we expect from an artist, it seems to me, over a span of a career? I mean, how many great paintings do we expect from an artist? I mean, not everything Picasso did was good. No. I, no. I, and I, think I don't care who it was. I think it's tough, but I think that we have a right to expect from an artist his very best. And that when we say, you know, frankly, I liked your blue period, but you know the great, the great joke in, in that Woody Allen movie. We've talked about it. Uh, yes. Such a good joke. Stardust, Stardust Ballroom. Is that what it's called? <laughs> yeah. Stardust Memory. Right. <laughs> I still like it where this, this flying saucer lands and these Martians get out and the, one of them says to him, we are familiar with your work, although we prefer the earlier funny pictures. <laughs> and absolutely killed me seeing it because that's what it feels like is wherever you go. There's somebody to say, oh, that graduate, it's just my favorite. <laughs> I know. It's like I get people will come up to me and say, I love your show. And then they'll mention the Mike Nichols interview, which I did in 1991. Yes. <laughs> there have been seven years of shows since I did the Mike Nichols interview <laughs> in 1991. The designated mourner, just before we close out, what, a year ago? I think so, yeah. yeah. Okay. Acting again for the first time in a long time. Variety said this about you at the time, basically said, um, headlined by a powerful performance from Mike Nichols at the heart and soul of the picture, he is a revelation moving smoothly from insouciance to pure emotion in the blink of an eye. Did you, why did you go act again? And did you get something out of it that whetted your appetite to do it again? Uh, well, the answer to the last question is no, I don't want to do it again because I got what I wanted. I, I just wanted the experience. It was, it was sort of research for my job. I, I wanted to see what it was like for the actors because I deal with the poor bastards every day. Yeah. Um, and acting on stage was pretty much what I thought and I liked it and I liked being directed and I liked being with my colleagues Miranda Richardson who's a, a wonderful actress and I, I loved that experience but then shooting it we're, three big days we shot it um, I really did learn something very useful which is how lonely movie acting is I had no idea that you're sitting there, and by the time they've measured the distance to your nose for the third time, I felt like I was back in boarding school. You know, it was deeply lonely. And they're all on the other side of the camera in the dark, literally whispering about you. And you're sitting here, you know, pretty fat, and being photographed. It's very, very sad. <laughs> and... When, and I liked being reminded, I, not even being reminded, I liked understanding that. And I think it makes a difference to know that the, the actor on the other side of the camera that everybody thinks is so lucky and so highly paid and so sought after and people are touching up the makeup and all that stuff, how lonesome and alienated 
that person is. That was very useful. I liked that. There were moments when I would come to him and I could just tell by the way he was there and the way his emotional response was at a given moment or asking, answering certain questions of mine that I had. He, he was inside the character of Libby, inside the heart so of Libby. So when he got there, he knew we were there and he yeah. could communicate to you. That's just perfect. And you know what? It's not so lonely. Yeah. You know, because you have somebody there with you. You have somebody who's a little older and a little wiser and, and, and who, who can give you that kind of unspoken comfort that you need. You can see it from the outside or the inside now. Yes. Uh, directing also, you were said once, because you lost your father when you were 12, gave you a chance to be daddy. Mm -hmm. To be what? Well, what I learned... And I learned, it's weird, I learned this the first week I directed my first play, Neil's Barefoot in the Park, and it's what he said, we were so happy working together, and, and to this day, Neil Simon is the only writer of comedy whom I've never heard say it would get a laugh if he said it right. He never, never thinks that, he just writes something else, never blames the actor, but the moment I started directing, I understood that to reassure someone is as reassuring as though someone were doing it for you. That if it's taking place, if someone is being daddy, it doesn't matter so much what end you're on. Mm -hmm. That was an enormous discovery for me. And I, I happened to mention it to Arthur Penn who had directed Elaine and me on Broadway and who was a friend. And he said, oh, yes. He said, that's the best kept secret about directing. And I, I think it's true in, in any job where you, to some extent, take care of other people. It is as though someone were taking care of you, and that's the best we get if our father is gone. We've got to do it ourselves. There's no alternative. And the act of giving is also receiving. Seems like. Yeah. Mike Nichols, thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.